Thank you so much for your patience. What we are about to do now is not move to the panel, but we are going to do a very, very quick synopsis of what happened at the workshops yesterday. This way you can begin to assess the direction we're trying to go. And this assessment will come from Baba James Smalls, Mama Sherry Lewis, and Mama Leonard, Baba Leonard Kwako Jeffries. But before we begin, please, let us stand for the Nkosi Sikilele in Africa. Nkosi Sikilele Africa Manu Famisu Handorayo Isai Mitanda Yetu Kosi Sikilele In the name of our ancestors, we see Ashe. 
At this time, please call upon those ancestors that you come with, those ancestors that you are possessed with, because you came in the spirit and the manifestation of our great ancestors. That's who you are. Please call out their names at this time. Ashe? 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 Please call out their names. Ashe? 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 Call out their names. Say it louder. Call out their names. Ashe? 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 Ashe yo! Ashe yo! Ashe yo! It's not just calling out their names, it's being them. We have to be our ancestors. That's the reason why we're here, to be them, and we must become like them. And this world will be changed overnight. Every single day, call upon those names. At this time, we ask you to give special blessings to our people. Those in Africa, our homeland, say Ashe. Those in the Caribbean, we say Ashe. Those in South America, we say Ashe. Those in North America, we say Ashe. Those in Central America, we say Ashe. Those in German Spanish, we say Ashe. Those in all over Europe, we say Ashe. Those in Asia, we say Ashe. 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 We ask you now to call upon those family names who have blessed you. Call upon those family names who are blessing you today. Ashe. 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 Ashe, Ashe, oh! And if you don't have models in your family, you must be the model for your family. Ashe! At this time, brothers and sisters, thank you for coming out. Thank you for your love. And just look to your brothers and sisters again and say thank you. And now, Baba James Small, then. Mama Shelby and Mama Jeffries will give a quick synopsis of what happened today and this way we will know how to proceed for the rest of the day. I'm looking at Mama Swanston. Please, stand up Mama Swanston. Give this great African elder some love. Secretary. Personal Secretary for the great Dr. Henry Clark. The great Henry Clark. The great John Henry Clark. The great Dr. Clark. The great John Henry Clark. Ashe? Ashe. Where the children? Please stand up, children. Just look to the children, just raise your right hand to the children and say, we love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you, dear beautiful children. In the African tradition, salvation is through our children. Salvation is through our children. No children, no future. The sisters in the house, please stand up, great sisters. Please stand up, beautiful African woman. African woman. Brothers, you need to be clapping louder, brothers. That's 
That's right. We love you, sisters. We love you, sisters. I will do anything for you, sisters. That's right. That's right. That's right. Just tell me what you want to do, and I'll do it. That's it. That's it. That's it. African woman. Brothers. Stand up, brothers. Stand up, brothers. Sisters, please give the brothers a strong African men some love. That's right. These warriors. Ready for the revolution. That's right. Ready for the, for the revolution. Ready for the African revolution. Thank you again, Africa. Asante, Asante. Thank you, Brother Manuel. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Yesterday we had a workshop on culture, and um, that report I think is rather brief. Um, I think it was um, we discussed that culture cannot exist by itself. That culture is tied to economics. It's tied to your politics that it is your culture that indeed inform your politics in terms of the strategy, ethics, and morals, and principles that govern the distribution of your economics. And as Marima Ani has explained to us, and we discussed yesterday as one of the, I think we settled on four things that we wanted to bring back. And the first of those things that culture protects the people from genocide. Culture protects a people from genocide. The second thing we want to be clear about was that culture was a people's educational system, primary educational system. That it is culture that carry out the intergenerational transmission of the wisdom of the ancestors to the next generation. That culture is the thing that defines the relationship of a people to their creator. Culture defines the relationship of a people to their creator. And at the heart of what we call culture is a people's spiritual system. And at the center of that spiritual system is the people's notion of God. And in our deliberations and discussion in the lecture that I gave, I have to explain that if what we call God, whether it's called God or Jesus or Allah or Yahweh or Elohim, when it exists and it's omnipotent, omnipresent, omnipotent and supreme, there is no room for nothing else to exist. And looking at African culture explaining itself through its various systems of explanation from the Dogon to the Yoruba, from, from the Igbo to the Akan, from Kemet to the Congo, it always explains itself as emanating from that thing that we reference as being the God. Because there's no room for nothing else if it is omnipotent, omnipresent, and supreme. Then what are we? We are aspects of its essence as expressed in this ecology. And so our struggle should be to perfect that consciousness. And I did a um, quote from the book of the Pyramid Text one of the older texts that reference our people's um, explanation of their coming into being. And the Creator says, I created myself out of myself into existence, that existing might exist. And a brief understanding of that is that the Creator is constantly recreating itself. And so, we are like, when we look at our culture, we are like the particles of light that makes up the beams of light that emanates from the source that is the light. 
And so without your culture, you're vulnerable for the acts of genocide that we've been vulnerable for all of these centuries. And that it is imperative for Pan-Africanism to move forward. If it's to move forward, it cannot move forward without some serious examination of African culture being a part of the vehicle that moves it forward. Otherwise, we'll just end up with imperialist and black face. And I think our last 30, 40 years have shown us how well we can do that to ourselves. And so culture is how people protect themselves from genocide. And culture is our people's worldview as passed down over generations. Culture involves, of course, all of the tools and implements, language, music, dance, instruments that we use to convey the values, interests, and principle that we extract from the laws that our people discern from the universe to explain how to build the character we need to have in order to behave in our environment in a harmonious, balanced way. And I think that's about as much a synopsis as can be. We know that within the context of all of that, there are many religions and they've evolved over different times and we discussed them, all of the major ones and some of the minor ones. They evolved at different times in history, all for the same reason. African people attempting to restore themselves to being the essence of God itself. And hopefully one day when we restored our character, we will not be afraid when somebody say, who are you? To say, I'm God having a human experience, who are you? But again, culture primarily protects the people from genocide. Culture is the primary educational system for any people. Culture, and I got that piece from sister, from brother Asa, carries out the intergenerational transmission of wisdom from one generation to the other. You know, culture tells you what your worldview should be so that you can make decisions on what you need to do next. Without culture, you cannot even define your enemy. Without culture, you can't recognize who are your friends. So those are the points, and when the written document is done, there'll be more explain more explicitly for Saturday, which will be ready to be handed out. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that the economic workshop had some of the most dynamic and committed people that I've ever worked with. prepared to discuss and work. And like the cultural workshop, we agreed right off that all three of the workshops were related. Were related. One did not exist in a vacuum. I think we ultimately agreed that um, knowledge is indivisible and that we separate these things out because our human minds can't really get around all of it at once. But what's happening in the political workshop, in the cultural workshop, and the economic workshop, all has to come together. We then moved on and decided that, you know, we begin with a world view, and that all of us came to this conference, really, with a Pan-African world view. But that vision and that worldview, which has been um, shared, been written about, been talked about for more than a century, is not enough to get us where we need to be. And we talked about ways of getting where we need to go. And I think the group agreed that we did not want to leave this conference like we have so many conferences, just feeling good about what we said. We wanted to have some concrete products of our work here. Um, 
I think I'm correct in, in paraphrasing, though I, we, we had a wonderful person who was recording what we said, and I've got his notes here. We have a list of the people who were there with their phone numbers and email addresses, and everybody's saying we're going to have to get together and hold this together. But um, Brother Jamoke um, made it clear in his notes that um, we need a plan, that there are many plans out there, but which is the plan that's going to get us where we, go, where we need to go? We talked about strength and power. People were saying we need to speak with strength that strength in numbers is important, strength in resources is important, leadership, planning. We need to be strong. Strength to power. Strength so that when we speak, we are recognized. We want to sit at the Pan-African table, but who decides who sits at the table? Who is strong enough to represent the diaspora, to represent this group? We recognize that there are other people in the US and elsewhere that are organizing, that are doing things. Are we talking about putting together an umbrella that involves taking advantage of what is being done? We know that some people get publicity when they do things. Uh, just last night for the NACP Awards, Trumpet Awards, um, people were talking about what they are doing. Susan Taylor was talking about this big empowerment group that she's talking about, uh, putting together with leaders of the NACP and Urban League and all of the big groups coming together. Well, they're part of this too. So we need to start talking about how we do all of this together. Now, I think that the group talked about some things that aren't strictly economic, but they relate. The first point people continued to make was, we've got to unchain our minds. <laughs> that we're not going to get there thinking the way a lot of people think. Uh, you can call it brainwashing, you can call it mind shackles, you can call it minds messed up, as people say, but that's a problem, and that's a reality. That reality is not just in the U.S. That reality is on the continent of Africa. That reality is in Latin America and the Caribbean. That reality is in Asia, where, as most of you know, the largest concentration of people of African descent are in India. So we've got to open our minds and see ourselves. We got to deal with the cultural thing that uh, uh, Professor Smalls is talking about. We've got to see ourselves as a strong, worthy African people so that we can trust each other and move with each other. So dealing with cultural imperialism was, I think, the first order for our group. The second point that was made, and made very strongly in different ways by different people, is that we've got to use the resources that we have. One person pointed out that, you know, there's money. There's money out here. A lot of us have money. Barbara Sizemore used to say, you all remember Barbara Sizemore, a very dynamic sister, she would say, people talk about there's no money in this community. Well, I walk around, she said, look at these huge churches. Where did that money come from? Look at the Cadillacs in the yards. Where did that money come from? Look at the shoes. Look at the telephones. So there is money. How do we get that money and use it to benefit all of us? There was even a suggestion that we use our money and, and have uh, a Pan-African Development Fund or Pan-African Development Bank that would provide resources for people to move on. But a lot of time was spent talking about both the human 
and material resources that we need. Because human resources, as someone said, is not always about money. We need expertise and we need people to do certain kinds of things. A third point that people made had to do with communications. How do we network and share information? We didn't talk about it, but I think it was understood by everyone. How do we control our communication? How do we, we, we can't uh, stop it all together because Brother Clinton is um, spying on all of us, but how do we sort of prevent the infiltration of those who would destroy what it is we're trying to do? How do we communicate? Uh, do we set up a network? Are we talking about the internet? Are we talking about radio, television? Uh, what is it that we need to do to talk to each other? And I think the general agreement is that we need to talk, but we don't need to be talking to others at the same time. We need to be talking to each other so that we know where we're going and we know what we're doing. And I think it was generally agreed that we don't need the publicity. We don't need to be media stars. Those who get things done, get them done quietly. Uh, John Henry Clark always tells this story about African leaders who are fakers. There are those who are out in front and they get killed off, but the real leader is behind. Well, we're talking about a need for those who are going to work hard and who are committed. The fourth thing we talked about, which really was the main thing on our mind, was organization. What kind of organization are we talking about? What type of structure would be permanent? What type of structure could we sustain over time? We've had huge organizations in the past. Garvey's movement was very, very big. I know people in Louisiana still have cards. That was a big movement. Why didn't it sustain itself? <clears throat> What happened to a lot of other movements, the, the, the Pan-African movements that Du Bois and others started? What stopped it? How do we study our past and come up with an organization that is strong enough so that we could withstand all of the problems, all of the pressures, all of the things that, uh, that make us tumble? What kind of group, what do we organize where there's accountability? Where those people are not making decisions for themselves. You see, we've got organizations in the U.S., we've got organizations and, and uh, states in Africa and other places, and the people in power are making decisions so that they and their friends and their families can make money. It is not for the benefit of all. So we need an organization that has the interests of the Pan-African world at heart. We need an organization that is about doing things and giving back, not about self-enrichment and self-aggrandizement. We don't need an organization where there are leaders who just run every time there's a microphone. Who think that being on CBS or CNN means you're doing something. We need people who are in the trenches every single day doing what has to be done. So I think, well, there were a couple of other points that are very important. There was one sister who said, you always say that you're going to deal with health, but it always gets lost. People who are ill, dying, can't be very helpful. And I, and I thought about the fact that uh, I have been working with some groups in Africa uh, of late in Zambia. And the percentage, these are, these are school systems, 
the percentage of teachers that have been lost to HIV AIDS is astounding. What happens to an educational system? What happens to the repository of culture if our people are so sick that they're dying off? All of this is very important. So, sister, I don't know whether you're here today, but uh, we, we're trying to get health into it. We're getting education into it. We understand that all of the aspects of life that make a quality life for African people need to be put into our strategy and put into our plan. And uh, with what uh, Brother Smalls and his group was talking about, and what we're about to hear from what Lynn Jeffries and his group was talking about, we think we can put all of these three together and come up with a strategy with some priorities, with a commitment, and even a structure that's going to move us forward. And I'd just like to end by thanking all of those members of that economic workshop for these great ideas. Hotel brothers and sisters, yes, sir. is the mic on? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Certainly a uh, great moment to see all of you here uh, this morning. Yesterday was very fruitful. We came together to map out a strategy or plan. Today we're going to perfect it. Tomorrow we'll continue that process. So I'm just giving you a summary of what the political dimension of the three workshops uh, it was all about. First and foremost, though, I want to thank uh, Brother Minister Melnick and those of his extended family for pulling us together. <laughs> it does take some effort uh, to get the scholars uh, who are called upon to travel around the world and I'm glad to see that uh, the mayor of East Point kept her husband at home so he could be here with us as Dr. Asa uh, Hilliard. Uh, I don't know how Alambe slipped out of New York, uh, but he was able to get here. Uh, and of course, we have a potential mayor and congressman who we hope will either get the mayor of New York or he'll be the congressman to support Cynthia McKinney. And Brother Barron, Charles Barron is here. <laughs> so it's great to see so many of you. And of course, um, we've had a continuous relationship uh, that's developed in a very strong Pan-African way with the Nation of Islam. So uh, one of the leaders of the nation that has a base in Africa, and he has an undying love for Africa, because even when he was sick, and he came back to America to get healed. When he got well, he went right back to Africa. We have our brother Akbar, Minister of Health. So it's good for the young people and others to see that we've come together as a family. That's what it's all about. Family will have different approaches to things, but the Pan-African family component of our larger family has to get itself organized. One of the organization activities, which will be significant, will occur in three weeks. That's March the 23rd. Take your pencils and uh, pens and note it down. March the 23rd to the 26th. And uh, part of the family that has been doing an enormous work in liberating the African American uh, and joining in those other strategies that we need will be coming together in Newark, New Jersey uh, for the annual conference, international conference of ASCAP, the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization. I have to take time out to emphasize that because I'm hosting, along with Sister Latrella, President of the Eastern Region, this conference. It's being hosted in my hometown. It's being hosted in our own place for the first time. Uh, we've been at the colleges and we've been at other institutions at the hotels, but now the women in support of the Million Man March that were inspired after the great meeting of the family 
1995, they pulled together a center 